Hi, Brother Roy here. Welcome to Old School Bible Baptist. Hey, today we're going to do the last chapter of my book, Voices. And this is chapter 11, Counterfeits. It will be followed by a final word. Hey, Amen. Let's get started. Last one, right? All right, here we go. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2.11 Another attack on biblical Christianity today is the modern charismatic movement. The groups caught up in this error believe that miraculous signs and wonders performed by the Christ and the apostles in the four gospels and the book of Acts are still in effect today. The book of Acts is a transitional book it records the transition from Israel to the church. The special apostolic signs and wonders were part of God's prophetic program for Israel. As God stops dealing with them as a nation, the apostolic signs and wonders fade away. The main two sign gifts that are emphasized in most charismatic groups are miraculous healing and speaking in tongues. They were special apostolic gifts and faded off the scene with the apostles. They were a package deal and all ceased for the same reasons, but I will focus on just one here, speaking in tongues. Let's see what the Bible says about tongues. It has been rightly stated that a text without a context is a pretext. Webster's Dictionary defines pretext as a purpose stated or assumed to cloak the real intention or state of affairs. In other words, an excuse. The modern charismatic doctrine of speaking in tongues is built on scripture taken out of context and misapplied. So, if we want to know what the Bible says about tongues, we need to look at and understand a whole lot more than a few verses in Acts and 1 Corinthians. We need the context. Miles Coverdale, who completed his translation of the English Bible in 1535, is also famous for this quote, It shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture, if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. Another important rule for interpreting Scripture is the law of first mention. This rule states that the first time a word appears in Scripture, how that word is used sets the tone, associations, and basic meaning of the word throughout the rest of Scripture. The first mention of tongues or languages in the Bible is in Genesis chapters 10 and 11, where they came into being. Up until then, everybody spoke the same language. At Babel, other tongues were introduced as a judgment of God for man's belief, unbelief, and disobedience. Tongues were a sign of judgment. Now observe the tone, associations, and basic meaning of tongues throughout the Old Testament in God's dealing with the nation of Israel. Look at what Moses said. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the ends of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Deuteronomy 28, 49. Look what King David says. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of God of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood not. Psalms 81, 4 and 5. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of a strange language. Psalms 114 and 1. Isaiah warned them, for with stammering lips and other tongue will he speak to this people. Isaiah 28 and 11. Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of a deeper speech than thou, that thou canst not understand. Isaiah 
33, 19. Along comes Jeremiah, about 100 years later. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what thou what they say. Jeremiah 5, 15. A few years later, Ezekiel, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech or of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Ezekiel 3, 5. Tone, association, and basic meaning. What? God's judgment at the hands of a foreign nation. If you were a Jew in the first century, the time of Christ and the apostles, you would know all this history and understood the context of the sign of tongues. When Jesus tells the Jews, your house is left unto you desolate, Luke 13, 35, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, Luke 21, 20. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24. This put con puts context to what he then said after his resurrection, shortly before that judgment came. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Mark 16, 17. They would continue to warn Israel about his coming judgment by the sign of tongues. And that is exactly what the apostles did on the day of Pentecost. They stand up and preach a message of condemnation upon Israel because they had murdered Jesus. Notice carefully what the message preached in Acts chapters 2 and 3 is. Peter preaches the fact of the crucifixion, but does not base any offer of salvation upon it. Rather, here the cross condemns those that hear the message. There is nothing in these early messages about the death on the cross paying for an individual's sins as later revealed. Peter accuses and warns, Ye men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and killed the Prince of Life, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Acts chapters 2 and 3. Peter was speaking with new tongues and preaching judgment, and Israel understood. 3,000 repented that first day, and thousands more in the following days. Tongues only happen three times in the book of Acts. In each case, there were Jews present who didn't believe something, and the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. In Acts chapter 2, there were a bunch of Jews who didn't believe that Jesus was their Messiah. In Acts chapter 10, a bunch of Gentiles speak with tongues because there were Jews present who didn't believe that God would save the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 19, God allows a bunch of Jewish disciples of John the Baptist to speak in tongues because they had not yet believed on Jesus Christ. Israel was being warned and given a second chance to receive Jesus Christ. What was the national response from the rulers of the people and the nation as a whole? The Jews in Jerusalem gave their response by stoning Stephen while he was preaching Jesus to them in Acts 7. The Jews in Asia rejected the gospel in Acts chapter 13. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Acts 13, 46. The Jews in Europe reject the gospel in Acts chapter 18. And Paul tells them, 
And when ye they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. Acts 18.6 Finally, the Jews in Rome, representing all the world, reject the gospel in Acts chapter 28. Paul tells them, Be it known therefore unto you that sal the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Acts 28, 28. This is what Paul is talking about concerning Israel in Romans. Through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. Romans 11, 11. This is the fall of Israel. Now put all of that in historical context. The Jews' rejection of Christ at Rome took place about 62 AD. Israel had been being warned by the sign of tongues of com the coming judgment since Peter's first message on the day of Pentecost. They harden their hearts, reject the warning, and reject Christ. Eight years later, Titus of Rome marches his legions down and destroys Jerusalem just as prophecy and the sign of tongues had been warning. Israel will not be a nation again for almost 2,000 years. The event that the sign of tongues had been warning about took place. God is done dealing with Israel as a nation until the end of the church age, when they shall be restored. The book of 1 Corinthians is the only place that speaking in tongues is mentioned in the New Testament outside of the three times we talked about in the book of Acts. The book of 1 Corinthians was written about 57 AD. This is 13 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. The sign of tongues was still in operation at that time. And the church at Corinth was a very Jewish church. When Paul gets to Corinth around 54 AD, he lives and works with a certain Jew named Aquila, Acts 18, and he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, Acts 18.4, and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshiped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, Acts 18, 7 and 8. Tongues were very active in the church at Corinth due to the large Jewish presence. Paul opens up his letters to them with, for the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. When Paul gets to cha the chapter where he gives the rules for speaking in tongues, he reminds the Corinthians what tongues are for. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. That is so clear. What did he say? Tongues were for Israel. They were a warning that Israel would ignore. They were not for believing Israel, but for unbelieving Jews, just as we have saw demonstrated through the whole Bible all the way back to Genesis. The whole chapter in 1 Corinthians is a rebuke for the way the Corinthians were abusing the gift of tongues in their church. The context of the whole chapter is in the church. Just to make sure everybody got that, Paul re repeats the phrase seven times in the chapter. Verses 4, 5, 12, 19, 28, 34, and 35. There is nothing in 1 Corinthians or anywhere in the Bible about a spiritual prayer language that somebody is supposed to practice in private. In order to create that teaching, you have to pull a couple verses out of their context and stick them together with bubble gum. It is make-believe. When Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, that is called hyperbole. Webster's defines it as an extravagant exaggeration used as a figure of speech. Like saying, though I could leap tall buildings with a single bound. Look at the multiple examples of exaggeration in the rest of the passage. Understand all mysteries. Have all faith. Remove mountains. Have all knowledge. Give my body to be, bur to be burned. The first three verses of the chapter 
are hyperbole. Paul is not claiming these things. He is just saying, even if. You can't create a spiritual prayer language out of that. Another verse that is misunderstood to create this imaginary language is, likewise, also, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, 26. Webster's Dictionary refines uttered as to send forth as a sound. What you have in this verse is the Holy Spirit praying inside of you with groanings which are not sent forth as a sound. No sound, no words, no imaginary language. Here's another one. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Remember the context of the chapter. It is conduct in the church service. What if Paul is telling them that if there is no interpretation of what is said, then God is the only one who knows. Paul says much the same thing in verse 9. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken, for ye shall speak into the air. 1 Corinthians 14, 9. This all had to do with his rebuke of the church for speaking in tongues without an interpreter. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. No imaginary spiritual prayer language anywhere in these verses. One more. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. It is not the act of speaking in tongues that edifies anyone. It is the content of the message when interpreted. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? 1 Corinthians 14, 6. That is why Paul then says this, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 and 14. If nobody knows what is being said, it is unfruitful and edifies no one. That's why the person doing the speaking must pray that he may interpret. Again, this is all about speaking in tongues and interpreting in the church service. No imaginary prayer language anywhere in the chapter. In verse 15, Paul says that if he pray with the Spirit, he will give the understanding also. He says that if he sings with the Spirit, he will do the same in the church. Everywhere tongues appear in Scripture, they are known languages and can be interpreted. They are identified as soon as they show up. Law of first mention. Every man heard them speak in his own language. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Acts 2, verses 6 and 8. Paul said, Therefore it may be so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. 1 Corinthians 14, 10. Webster's Dictionary defines signification as the meaning that a term, symbol, or character regularly conveys. In other words, no nonsensical babbling. Tongues, as practiced today, is unscriptural, deceptive, and worthless as a sign. We need to judge our experiences and feelings by the Word of God, not the other way around. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Jeremiah 17, 9. There's a lot of stuff that comes from our soul which can feel spiritual, but is not. It is just emotion, self, and flesh. We cannot go by our feelings. We have to go by the book. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing what to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. 
Hebrews 4.12. That sword will make a clean cut, as we have just demonstrated, showing you what is from the Holy Spirit and what is not. Paul was very clear. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. 1 Corinthians 13.8. They were a warning sign to Israel. When Israel rejected the warning and Christ, they were cut off and tongues ceased. Period. The same with the other sign gifts, including miraculous healing. God still heals miraculously. He's God. He can do anything. We can all pray for healing for ourselves and for others. God will answer our prayers according to his will. The apostolic gift was given to a person in the time of Christ and the apostles as a sign fulfilling Old Testament prophecy to Israel. It was 100% and they were healed every one Acts 5.16. If that existed today, that person should be going up and down the hallways of every children's hospital they could get to all day, every day. No. Faith healers are crooks and fakes fleecing the flock. Their charismatic error places your focus on self, emotion, and counterfeit spiritual experiences. The person under the spell of all that will not be walking in the real Holy Spirit and won't be able to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. They will have to agree at some level to believe in make-believe, something that is either not real or not of God. Jesus is real. The Bible is real. The Holy Spirit is real. But when you attach things that are not real to them, you taint their credibility and cause people to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Satan will point out all the fake stuff and say, see, all that Jesus Bible stuff is phony. So, you see, what people always say, as long as they preach Jesus, don't speak against what they're doing. No, adding all that make-believe stuff to the gospel discredits the truth and purity of the message. Let me give you a personal example or two. My mother was raised strict Roman Catholic. All of the teaching of that church are not wrong. They believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all good. But when you get to the part uh, where sprinkling on a baby's head gets it into heaven, or a priest can forgive your sins, or turn a piece of bread into Jesus Christ, and you receive him in your mouth for salvation, that is all make-believe. None of that is real. And my mom had enough sense to see that. And as soon as she was old enough, she got as far away from that as she could and never set foot in church again. As long as she lived, except for weddings, funerals, and such, she threw the baby out with the bathwater. Because of the make-believe stuff attached to the truth, she rejected the truth all of her life. Satan is doing the same thing with the modern charismatic movement today. People see all that signs and wonders stuff for what it is and judge the whole of the Christian message in light of the make-believe. We had a church group as guest speakers in our prison chapel. The speaker had men line up with medical problems. He was speaking nonsensical babbling at them, trying to command their legs to straighten out. The whole act. I stepped out into the hallway and was watching through the window. Behind our chapel is the land where the pagan religions do their thing. Vikings, witches, Satanists, etc. The prisoner in charge of that area, who is part of one of those groups, was also watching from the hallway. He looked over at me and he said, Roy, I don't believe in that stuff, do you? Think about that. An unsaved pagan convict had enough common sense to spot a con job when he saw it. While some of the brothers in our church where I was serving as pastor, were lining up for this nonsense. This is why those brothers are used to hearing truth from behind the pulpit. They trust the words of the men behind the pulpit. That is why it is the best place for the devil to slip something in. Christians believe what their preachers tell them. That is why James says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnations. James 3.1 Preaching and teaching God's word is an awesome responsibility, and we shall be held accountable for every idle word spoken. How can so many sincere Christians be so wrong about this subject of signs and wonders? They were, they, because they trusted the man who taught them, who trusted 
the man who taught him, who trusted a man who let the devil slip something in. It is not innocent, harmless error. There is no such thing. Dr. John R. Rice said, you can't teach bad doctrine without doing harm. Trace error back to the spiritual realm. If a teaching is not true and scriptural, it did not come from the Holy Spirit. If it did not come from the Holy Spirit, where did it come from? There's only one other source. It is a doctrine of devils, 1 Timothy 4, 1, which is causing people to misrepresent and replace the actual work of the Holy Spirit before the church and the world. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, Galatians 5, 9. Paul was talking about Jewish religion in that verse, but the principle applies. We have to keep it real. What we believe matters. What we believe affects what we do. What we do matters. If the devil can get you to believe wrong, he can get you to do wrong. And that concludes chapter 11. Throw in the final word. I think it's pretty short. Yep. This is the final word into the book. A final word. So, voices. The reality of the spiritual world and its influence on human thought and behavior. If you've made it to the end of this book, you may say at this point, all you talked about was the Bible. Yep, <laughs> now you're getting it. <laughs> the spiritual realm is just as real as the material world. There are only two voices coming from that spiritual realm. There's the voice of Satan manifested through the spirits of the air and this world that they control. The other voice is the voice of God and the Holy Spirit manifested in His Word, the Holy Bible. In the light of that truth and everything else we've covered in this book, listen one more time to Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Our whole world is an illusion created by Satan to deceive us. And the only spiritual truth in life is to be found in the Word of God. Those who refuse the word are unable to see because they have rejected light, have adopted other standards which they think are light, and are therefore in greater darkness. That just about sums it up. That is a hard truth. In the movie A Few Good Men, Tom Cruise had Jack Nicholson in court on the witness stand, and he tells Jack something like, I want the truth. <laughs> and Jack answers, the truth, the truth, you don't want the truth. You can't handle the truth. That is true of most people. If there is something about Dr. Barnhouse's statement that offends you, that is a measure of where you are spiritually. A better quote for you, a better quote for you might be one from the famous evangelist, Billy Sunday. Brother Billy said, The reason you don't like the Bible, you old sinner, is because it knows all about you. Remember what Jesus said, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. That was true when those words were spoken, and just as true today. But so is this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, John 1, 12, and 13. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter, Peter 1, 23. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. John 3, 7. And that's the end of my book. Thank you for bearing with me. Love you. Now we'll, now we'll serve you up some fresh bread. Huh? Make some new videos. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.